So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Niall Smith, and uh, I uh, am delighted to be able to have a chat with you this morning uh, about a topic uh, which uh, has two parts to it, really. The issue of low Earth orbit satellites, and for those of you who don't know about it, I'll explain a little bit about that in a, in a moment, uh, and also something that we're all familiar with, which is our national broadband plan. Uh, and I think we all know that there are challenges in the latter. Uh, probably many of us uh, would be less familiar with the challenges, but also, and more importantly, the opportunities in the former. Uh, so first of all, so by the way, when I say this is a chat, there isn't a, at the end of it a, like a da-da moment where we all say, okay, that's exactly what we need to do. It's an opportunity. If we think smartly through this issue as this technology develops, and there's a real opportunity uh, for Ireland. Uh, obviously, we have certain interests here in Cork as well, but satellites don't just fly over Cork. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes' time. Probably a fairly obvious comment. So the, the, the talk is structured around a couple of different uh, items, and I'll go straight into a little bit of a discussion about uh, low Earth orbit. So there's three different types of satellite. There is the geostationary ones, which uh, we're mostly familiar with and which caused confusion in the discussion about broadband. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. There's medium Earth orbit, and then there's the ones that we're really interested in, which is the low Earth orbit satellite. So, so these are somewhere between 160 and 2,000 kilometers, mostly actually now increasingly more towards the 160-ish, really around the 300 to 500 kilometers rather than the 2,000 kilometers. And there's a good reason for that, and there's a good reason why people want to do that, which will become evident uh, during the course uh, of the presentation. But before uh, talking about the LEOs a little more, a tiny bit of physics. So my background is in physics, so I have to tell you a little bit of physics. Um, and so if we think about the speed of light, uh, because a lot of what we do with broadband at the moment goes down fibers. So that's sending light down a fiber. There's a fundamental limit to how fast you can put something in a medium which isn't air. So the speed of light in a medium is the speed of light in vacuum divided by this thing called N, the refractive index. There's nothing you and me can do about that. That's a fundamental limitation of the universe in which we live. If we look at fibers, the refractive index is 1.47, which means that data will travel 47% slower in a fiber than in free space. That's not open for discussion, unless there's some new physics which we're unfamiliar with. That's not something that's open for discussion. So that immediately gets us thinking, if we can move from sending stuff down a fiber to sending stuff in free space, we're already increasing our speed of transmission, not necessarily the data rate, but the speed of transmission, the two are coupled by 47% without having to do anything else. So this is one of the reasons why people are interested in Leo. The second thing about fibers is if you look at this graph here, and I don't think I'll be able to, to the, the pointer doesn't really show on the screen here, but if you look at the way there's this, this, this absorption curve, ideally you would like that to be at zero, and it isn't. What that means is the fiber scatters light, it loses light, and by losing the light, uh, it means that we have to work somewhere where that will be at a minimum. And that happens to be around 1.5 microns or 1550 nanometers. Why is that important? Well, that means that when we send stuff down a fiber, 47% slower than in free space, we also have to send it at roughly one frequency. But if you go to free space, you're not limited to one frequency. So if we can now send things faster and use multiple frequencies, then we can do that in free space. And what operates in free space? Satellites. So there's a good basic fundamental rationale for taking operating in space seriously if you want to transmit data rapidly around the planet. The technology might be challenging, come to that in a second, and, and as I said, there's no, there's no da-da moment in that because it's an evolving thing, but what we like to look at is the fundamental physics behind it. And if it's saying to you, this is interesting, then the technology usually follows. In terms of constellations, this is a word I'll use. Constellations are where it's at at the moment. So this is an example of a constellation. It's actually a simulation of a, a constellation that's built by the SpaceX Corporation called Starlink. And it actually shows the path of the first 450 satellites. And you'll notice, and this will come up again, that many of them are flying over Ireland. So a constellation is when you put up a lot of satellites 
in low Earth orbit. Um, now, for some reason, the slides are, are, aren't working exactly in the way I'd like. So we talk about the National Broadband Plan then uh, uh, in association with that. So we have the, the, the satellites in orbit. We know that, in principle, we can send things much quicker. And then we come to ask, what's an application for it? So most of you, I think, will be familiar with uh, something like this map of Ireland in relation to broadband. So the reason why the government has allocated up to 3 billion to provide broadband is in the areas which are in yellow, they're considered not commercially viable. The population density is too small and the terrain is too difficult. So the, uh, in order to encourage or to meet the requirements of the National Broadband Plan, we have to subvent commercial operations. That's not fundamentally a bad thing, but the problem that we have in general is that the more we subvent, uh, the less we have to use for elsewhere. Actually, that's not the purpose of my talk. That's a political and that's a decision we make as a society. But I am going to point out that there are other opportunities in just a couple of minutes' time. So the amber areas in this diagram represent the 540,000 premises which uh, the government will... Uh, pay, as we say, at a capped value of 3 billion to roll out broadband too. So that's roughly 23% of the population. It includes many farms, small businesses, and many schools. So it's important that we connect this. We know that broadband connectivity is essential to sustainability of rural communities and obviously rural communities and any community is only sustainable if the businesses within them are similarly sustainable. So if we look at some of the key numbers from the National Broadband Plan, the 3 billion is the state capped value. It's suggested that 98% of the connectivity will be through fiber to the home. So this FTTH. Uh, there's a seven year window for the rollout. And this is one of the reasons why LEOs become really interesting because the most difficult parts of the connectivity, uh, according to the plan, need to be done within seven years. The data rates, you could argue, are modest, but if you go from almost no data to a 30 megabit downlink and a six megabit per second uplink, that has a transformational change. And actually, Jerry made a point to me recently that we rarely actually use those data rates. We talk a lot about it, but actually for a lot of the business we do, we don't use those data rates all the time. The other point on the broadband plan is that the fibers have to operate in the ground for 25 years. So, um, can I just go back here for a second? Because for some reason, uh, I want to, when I use the clicker, it, uh, it doesn't do it the way I'd like to do it. So, if you, excuse me just for a second. Okay, so. It's actually not quite going to do it the way it is. So here's the, here's the thing, don't change your laptop just before the presentation. It doesn't really matter to the content, it's just the style. Um, so if we look at other people's broadband plans, then what are others doing in terms of this? Well, just um, at the, in their budget last year, the Canadian government committed, as you will see here, to bringing reliable high-speed internet access to even the most challenging to reach rural remote communities in Canada using low Earth orbit satellite. They've allocated an initial $82 million to this particular process. If we look at countries in Africa, there's two countries in Africa have already signed agreements with a company called OneWeb, which we'll discuss or it'll come back into the conversation, to provide broadband to their rural communities by 2021. Within the US, there's a process or an initiative called Connect America 2. Connect America 2 is about bringing broadband to rural communities. And the largest two companies, SpaceX and OneWeb, got involved in Connect America 2 and then withdrew from the process. And the rationale for the withdrawing from the process, which would have seen subventions from the US government to bring rural broadband, was the following. It is more effective to leverage advanced technology and smart private sector infrastructure investment to reach America's unserved and underserved population rather than seek government subsidization for this effort. Innovation in space and ground technology 
will drive the cost of connectivity downward, ultimately reducing the need for taxpayer involvement in ongoing broadband expansion. Now, you could be skeptical and say, that's business doing something, you try to look behind what the rationale for that is. But the companies who are making these announcements are companies, for example, the likes of SpaceX, who are bringing astronauts to the International Space Station. If you do that, if you're given permission to do that, the most expensive experiment ever put up in, in the history of, of, of our species, over $100 billion has been spent on the International Station. The fact that NASA, the Russians and the Japanese allow SpaceX to connect with that tells you something about how much they trust the technology. The first two American astronauts to go into space since the space shuttle to be brought up by a non-Russian rocket will be brought up by SpaceX. So when you start to look at the pedigree of the private industry, you see it is actually outperforming the pedigree or the track record of some of the agencies in these domains. So when they say, we can bring you broadband commercially without the need for significant taxpayer investment, you have to take their comments seriously. It's still a discussion, but you have to take their comments seriously. So we need to start to take their comments seriously. So if we go on to the technology, and we ask them in terms of the technology, where is all this pressure coming from to bring for, for these low Earth orbit uh, satellites? Well, the first thing to notice is there's a thing called Space 4.0, and Space 4.0 is a bit like Industry 4.0. It's the next version of space. And this is a very busy slide, and purposefully so, because what I wanted to just give you an, an, a, a sense of is that almost every company, irrespective of the domain you work in, can connect into the Space 4.0. Whether you're building kits to go into space, where you're analyzing the data from space, whether that's artificial intelligence, whether it's autonomous, autonomous vehicles, whether it's microelectronics, whatever it is, the space industry now has matured to a stage where this is needed. Some in the short term, some for the longer term. For example, going back to the moon is a longer term example, although now we hear we're going back to the moon within five years. How will we do that? According to NASA, a complete paradigm shift, we'll use private industry to bring us there. If we look at the numbers associated with the global space industry, well, there's a report from 2017 by Morgan Stanley, which shows a green, a blue, and a red line. So it's kind of a, a, a pessimistic, a medium optimistic, and an optimistic line for the way that the global space industry will develop by 2040. So you go from roughly today, 350 billion, to roughly 620 billion, or up to maybe 1.75 trillion by 2040. However, Earlier this year, the European Investment Bank did its own analysis of where the global space industry is going. And if you look at the star up there in the middle with the EIB 2019, their estimate is that it will be 2.3 trillion by 2030. Why? Because we're starting to bring in things like low Earth orbit, satellite constellations, which back even in 2017 were kind of a discussion. Within a year and a bit, they've moved from the discussion phase to people actually implementing them. So the pace of change is very quick. Now that's always a challenge because you're never quite sure where it's going to land. But it's also something which, if you're looking for a solution to a particular problem, in this case broadband, then this rapid change in the technology is something which has actually happened between the time we started to try to figure out who the preferred bidder would be and sign, or not quite yet, but come towards the state of signing for that. Um, just as another comment about Space 4.0, additionally, satellites have been launched by agencies like NASA and the European Space Agency. Now, most of the satellites going up are launched by private companies. And they're launched for lots of different opportunities, lots of different markets, and there are some things that you can only do from space. So, for example, if you want to look at the Earth in, its, in, 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 in large order, the best place to do it from is from space. If you want to uh, do things like global positioning, the best place to do it from is space. Uh, we're seeing cheaper access because the volumes are going up, the materials are becoming so sophisticated, 
using in the automotive industry that we can immediately transfer into the space industry and vice versa. So the materials are designed, they exist. It's repurposing them is what's going on at the moment. So that's very exciting. You're not developing everything new. And so this phrase, cuts components off the shelf, is where the new space industry is going at the moment. Try to use as much of the very, very advanced technology, which you and me may take for granted. We take our mobile phone for granted, for example, but it's an incredibly sophisticated piece of infrastructure in itself and also in the way it connects globally. So space companies are not looking to do uh, development for the sake of it. They're looking for to bring solutions to problems which will make it commercially viable for them. And that's why I think in this context here, in, in this forum, this is really important. Because you could easily kind of go away and say, we heard this talk from this chap and he was talking about going to space and it's all very up there and, and so on. And maybe 10 years ago, that, that would have been true. But SpaceX, for example, reckon that they will, and I'm jumping ahead a tiny bit, they will make from their broadband activities $50 billion a year. That's their projected estimate. Now, maybe they won't, maybe they will. But it's huge numbers uh, that, they're, that they're looking at. So how do the... Uh, satellites in orbit actually operate. So this is actually one model. Now, I, I, I'm not favoring any particular model, but this is a SpaceX model. Uh, if you look at the yellow box, that's a satellite. The orange lines are it communicating with satellites around it. SpaceX are actually the only ones at the moment that are using optical or proposing to use optical communication between satellites. And what that does is it wraps the Earth in a web of connectivity between satellites. And this has massive implications. But one thing I will draw your attention to, this is a, a, a map from a guy, Mark Handley in University College London, uh, of the orbits of the first 400 SpaceX uh, satellites in their constellation, of which they've already la launched 60. And what you actually will see is that because of the way SpaceX have have considered the market, they've designed their satellites so that the connectivity is between the population centers, mostly in the northern hemisphere, that's where the population centers are densest. And because we just happen to be at the same latitude as the likes of New York and San Francisco-ish, actually that's a huge benefit to us. And again, we see that in a couple of minutes time. So just purely from our geography, the coverage we're going to get from this type of constellation uh, will be very impressive. Now, here's your favorite piece of the talk here. Your favorite piece might be at the end, but my favorite piece is right now, the latency. So I, I've heard conversations on the radio from ministers commenting the reason why we aren't going with satellite broadband is because of the latency. So if we connect Cork or London, as is shown here, to New York, if you look at the top right, you'll see the satellite return time is 46 milliseconds and the current internet is 76. If we go from London to San Francisco, you'll see the satellite time is 73, the current internet is 146. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems to be a smaller number if we go into space than if we stay using internet. Uh, if we go then to, uh, instead of going uh, east to west, if we go in the opposite direction, towards Singapore, then the current satellite time, the top right there is 159 milliseconds, and we can do it in space in 89 milliseconds. Now it varies a little bit because you're hopping between satellites and so on. Now suppose you say, okay, but well, that's a simulation, that's not actually happening at the moment, and that's true. But the, the uh, imperative or the, the advantages of making sure that that technology, which really in a way you can do on the surface of the Earth, you're just trying to do it in space. And quite honestly, if you can do it on the surface of the Earth, we're moving into a domain where you're just going to be able to do it in space. So it's that transference of technology. But the advantages of being able to do that are what makes it commercially interesting. And that's why, for example, the likes of SpaceX have gone for this inter-satellite, satellite-to-satellite communication. Now, I'm not a promoter of SpaceX. I'm making a comment about them. They're also the ones who tell you most of what they're going to do at the moment. This is something that uh, you'll find. Um, so the other thing uh, is about the coverage. So the way that the satellites work is each of them has a beam 
and the beam covers a certain area. Here you'll see if you have 72 satellites, we've just moved those 72 satellites up to 264 satellites. And if you look at the coverage, you'll see there's a couple of holes in the coverage in certain places. But actually, if we tighten that beam so the, the signal-to-noise ratio is higher, you'll see with 264 satellites, there's a number of holes, but not where Ireland is. If you actually look, because of the configuration of the, of the orbits, Ireland actually, even under a narrower, higher signal-to-noise ratio uh, uh, beam, uh, has continuous coverage. Uh, we didn't ask for this. It's one of those few times, and just because where we are on the planet, we get this for free. Uh, incidentally, uh, the satellites I've shown in terms of low Earth orbit have all been kind of going, well, up to 55 degrees or something, angle relative to the equator. Uh, that doesn't serve everybody on the planet. So although it won't be so obvious from this graphic, I think particularly with a little bit of light in here, there's also some satellites which will go over the poles to serve as very low uh, uh, densely populated areas, like, for example, the, the, uh, the Arctic or the Antarctic or places like Alaska and so on, where your, you know, your, your population density really is exceedingly low. So that's where we're going at with, if you like, the technology in relation to, to, to the low Earth orbit satellites. The idea is get many of them all up in low Earth orbit, they're moving relative to you, so that then means that you have to ideally connect between the satellites to bring the latency down, uh, and that then becomes uh, a, 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 it outperforms other methods of getting data around the planet. I'll say something more about that just before the end of the talk. So if we then look at some of the issues, if you like, to do with the implementation, well, the way that the implementation will work is you think of the satellite as having a beam. Now, there can be many beams associated with each satellite. And the beam is connected into a, 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 a receiver, a fate. Now, some of you, and we do this actually, there's a couple of companies in Ireland do this and will know much more about this than I will. But these phased array uh, receivers, the key thing about these phased array receivers, if you like, from an end user point of view, is that they, they're, they're completely solid state. You can put them anywhere you want. So SpaceX has got permission to uh, build, uh, within the US only at the moment, a million of these pizza-sized boxes which can be put wherever you want to. They're looking at the moment in particular for rural applications, but they also are looking at putting them into their Tesla cars in the first instance. And they're talking about already about they've, they've uh, about putting them they've, they've tested this out on a number of trains so just putting them on the roof of a number of trains and what you do then is you simply with your pizza box you know where they are and you 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 turn your beam forming receiver towards where the most appropriate low earth orbit uh, satellite is and you do the communication that way it's about a four watt transmission so we're all concerned about radiation, but it's low energy. Uh, whether that's low enough is another question, but it's a low energy radiation uh, box. Now, coming back to this idea of the visibility, and apologies again, the slides are just going in sequence rather than the way they had originally been intended. So, uh, but if we, so it looks like we're hopping from one slide to the other a little more than we should. But if we ask about this satellite visibility comment again, so. If we look here on the x-axis, we see the population density as a function of latitude on the planet. And you can see, as you might expect, that roughly 30 degrees north, most people live. That's where a lot of the, 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 the American and the Chinese and Indian cities live. So that's fair enough. But if you go then a little bit further north towards 52 or thereabouts, this is where we are. The red line shows roughly where Ireland is. We, can, we have information about three companies, OneWeb, Telesat, and SpaceX. This is based upon work done at MIT. There's a paper that this is taken from. It's an estimate. So there's a lot of commercial sensitive stuff. So rather than say, is this exactly the numbers? I, I don't know. And, and I wouldn't expect us to know at this moment in time. However, it's a reasonable estimate, we think, of the numbers. And at roughly 
50 odd degrees north, what you will see if you go to the SpaceX line, which is a green line, you'll see that the visibility of the satellites for SpaceX actually maximizes at 60 satellites. So satellites in line of sight is on the y-axis. You'll see the green line peaks just where the red line is. So we actually have more satellites in view than almost anywhere else on the planet, just by chance. So that's, that's good, uh, clearly, from our perspective. The other providers, like Telesat and OneWeb, have a much smaller number of satellites at the moment, with a slightly different approach, which we won't go into in the presentation. Uh, but the SpaceX guys are the volume guys at the moment. If we translate that into what we think our data are bandwidth, because this is what everybody's going to start to get interested in. Because in a way, your consumer doesn't care whether it's one satellite or a million satellites, okay? unless they're lighting up the sky or doing something else, which, which is disadvantageous. But from a data point of view, you just care, what's my, my, my bit rate? So these are estimates again. So SpaceX, the plan, the permission that they already have, and they have to launch actually by 2020, two 4,125 satellites. Uh, they claim 20 gigabits per second per satellite. If you take that there's 60 satellites above Ireland at any stage based upon the visibility, that's essentially around the one terabit per second. It's what we can expect in the first configuration of SpaceX. It's much lower for OneWeb and for Telesat because they have smaller numbers, but they're more directed at individual customers, high bandwidth customers. So SpaceX is kind of a, for everyone, uh, OneWeb and, and Telesat, from what we can tell at the moment. I mean, if, if we had representatives there, they might sit up with a hand and say, Niall, you're not quite right on that. So we're doing the best we can to understand what the, 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 the market is that's driving the different companies. But in terms of, if you don't have very, very many satellites up there, you're likely to be targeted. It's really difficult to see how you're not tar targeted. But so you take, for example, something like in Skibbering the Ludgate Hub, suppose now it is well connected, suppose it wasn't. So that's exactly the type of customer that uh, uh, OneWeb want to, want to address. Medium-sized operations where you need significant amounts of bandwidth in a relatively small uh, concentrated area. It seems to be the market that they're most interested in. What does that mean for the national broadband plan. Well, what it means is that if we take the number of 30 megabits per second, then the SpaceX configuration, and this, of course, started by 2022. I mean, that might only be three years away, but some, a lot could happen between now and 2022 in the positive. But that would be 8% of customers in the commercially and the non-commercially viable areas could be satisfied by the first configuration of SpaceX. I don't know about you, but to me, that then justifies the question at the beginning of the talk, should we be thinking about low Earth orbit satellites when we think about broadband? It might be that when we look more closely at this, it's not 8%, it's 4% or 12%. But one thing that we can be absolutely sure of, in as much as you can ever be absolutely sure, the data rates are only going to go in one direction. The data volume, the data rate per satellite is not going to go down. In fact, because we're likely to see a, another type of technology coming in, which I'll refer to in a minute, we're likely to see the data rates go up. Now, of course, as the data rates go up, you and me are anyway becoming more hungry for data. So there's this, we all want more data, there's more people using the internet, so the infrastructure has to try to keep up, but it has to go up as well. So it's not a static problem. It's a very dynamic problem. But this, to me, at the very least, is interesting. Because we're told, as I understand it, that the last 2%, the fiber, the, the non-fiber to the home, are likely to see some of that rollout very late on in the plan, towards the end of the seven years. Now, I, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on that. So I, I'm only trying to go by what I can gather from what's in the, in the media. I'm not privy to contracts. I, I have to make that very clear. But the, that is at odds with the possibilities of doing it using low-earth orbit satellites. 
So we got to at least somebody's got to be asking the question, has the technology changed sufficiently to make us rethink some of the national broadband plan? If we look at the way that the, the satellites are developing, uh, and uh, this is kind of a really indicative, for those of you who haven't seen the images uh, of the SpaceX satellites, well, here's an image of 60 of them. So if you haven't seen this before, they're roughly 220 kilos and they're flat. And then they have a solar cell which comes out the side and they don't have two solar cells. So most satellites are a box with two solar cells. The packing density for that in inside a rocket fairing is lower than if you do this. So what SpaceX have just done, and any company can do this, you don't have to be SpaceX this way. If you're a company who's able to build this kit, you can launch it. I mean, there's lots of private launchers who will put up your satellite. We're talking about SpaceX because they're the ones who are doing it at the moment. But if we all decided in the morning that we want to invest, I don't know, 500 million euros to put up 1,000 satellites, well, maybe not quite 1,000 satellites, we can do it. There's plenty of launchers. We don't have to develop the launch capability. What we have to figure out is how do we pack it in, and SpaceX have packed it more densely than anybody else at the moment. And we need to figure out, can we make data rates higher than our competitors? All the, usual, all the usual comments. But the entry into this marketplace, either if we're a user, which is what I think we start out as being, or somehow a, uh, somebody involved in driving it, it, it it's, it's now possible for countries the size of Ireland, for economies of the scale of Ireland, where it makes sense. Of course, we can work with our European partners and the European Space Agency and so on. Just a couple of very quickly, coming towards the end of the talk in a few minutes, the uh, we know there's a lot of, when you put up a lot of satellites, you have a lot of debris as well. So the SpaceX in, inherently have this autonomous uh, collision avoidance system built in. So they track material around them and they move their satellites around uh, to avoid this. Uh, and they also have a, a new system which they have developed, uh, which uh, uh, is based upon um, Krypton. It sounds really like Superman or whatever, but it's based upon uh, a Krypton engine. I don't know anything about Krypton engines, uh, but the weight to the power to weight ratio is better. So that's the kind of the key thing from, from an engineering perspective. And what that does, it allows them to raise the orbit, uh, but it also allows them then at the end of the lifetime to turn the spacecraft down and to burn it up in the atmosphere. So interestingly, SpaceX are suggesting that their satellites will, li will live in space somewhere between three and five years, and then will be replaced with satellites which have newer technology. So the idea has moved from putting a satellite up for maybe 10 years or 12 years, uh, which uh, may never come back, uh, or may take tens of thousands of years or whatever, and is hanging around there, to ones that are in a lower orbit for a shorter period of time, where you update the technology. Interestingly, uh, um, uh, the name of the company now escapes me, um, uh, it'll come back in a second, are, are looking at programmable uh, uh, satellites. So what they're saying is, okay, we need to be able to, when we put a satellite up, we need to be able to reprogram it. So that satellites no longer, traditionally they go up with a function. Now we're saying we put them up, they have some sort of function, but that functionality can be enhanced or amended or whatever. Um, the antenna are a key thing for us and actually I think this is a real interesting opportunity from an Irish perspective. Uh, first of today's talk isn't to, to select a particular thing because I'm not the domain expertise. We all have our domain expertise here. I'm trying to paint just a, a broader picture but from what I know of, the, of the, the, some of the communications technologies this is a really interesting area. So here you can see there's four of these beams so they just look like a, a square piece here. Uh, roughly square piece. The faster you can make those work, the better. I mean, I know that's a fairly obvious comment. But so we've got a 20 gigabit per second, so something like five gigabit per second per, per one of each of these uh, 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 transceivers. So then the question is how, how much faster can we make that? So who's working on what that can make that go quicker? I know that's a very general comment. Nevertheless, that's the point that that's where we're at. If you can do it faster, I would be very surprised if you didn't find commercial companies quite willing to do a deal with you to put your technology on their satellite. 
because at the end of the day, it's about moving data around the planet. That's where the money is. So if we look then in conclusion, and there's lots I didn't talk about, but I'm trying to keep it because I think we have some uh, Q&A and all the rest, which is a scary bit. Um, but if we look at the, at, the, at the conclusions for this, then I, I would make a number of observations that I think stand up uh, and some then that maybe are of interest to that. The first thing is that the low earth orbit market is here, it's real, it's not going away, and it's a technology of now slash the near future. I can see no credible counter argument to that. There's nothing to suggest that the broad approach uh, that has been discussed uh, isn't, a viable, it, it isn't the most likely way that the, the technology will develop. Really importantly for me, latency is not the issue. The throughput might be the issue, but the latency, in fact, it could be the very opposite. The reason that I harp on latency, as I say, is that's what was mentioned by the government minister, uh, the rationale for not going with satellite broadband. And it just simply doesn't hold true, or it won't very soon hold true. Alongside the SpaceX guys, the Telesat and the OneWebs, they're not the only big players in town. Amazon will get into the market with their Kuiper constellation. And we all know what Amazon have done. And Amazon are a company with their cloud and so on, for example. I mean, they started out with one model. They've, they've, they've amended that model. Uh, Amazon have been talking about putting a cloud storage in space because that will also potentially speed up uh, uh, and or allow them to be more cyber secure. So you're having really interesting conversations from people who say, well, our product is about moving data around. So they're in the business. Uh, uh, it looks like about two or three years before they'll launch their constellation. Google, Facebook have also said that they want to get into this game. That's a bit less clear. So the developments in this, I think, are rapid. The question is, What's the bandwidth? What can we ultimately expect from the bandwidth? Now, interestingly, and I, I won't forget it, and Rory mentioned already, we, we have one also huge advantage in Ireland, two, two advantages. One, we're on the western seaboard of, the, of, the, of Europe, which just geographically also means that low Earth orbit satellites, which would be otherwise over the horizon, are visible from Ireland. It places us in a very nice sweet spot, gives Rory all sorts of interesting new uh, opportunities with some of which he mentioned in brief uh, already. And the second thing is we actually have in this region, I know not all of you come from this region, we have a, a, an existing tele one, Ireland's only teleport station. We have the infrastructure already existing. It may be we need to make the pipe for that infrastructure bigger so that we can bring down more of the data from these low Earth orbit satellites when they need to connect to the Earth. Just by the way, as a point, so, and it may be I'm going to say it anyway. If I want to phone somebody in America with my mobile phone, the way this works is I connect straight to the satellite. Okay? Now, it may be through a router, so but straight to the satellite. I don't need to go through a connecting station. That goes on the other direction. However, if I want to access something from Google or something from a data center, then that's where the likes of the teleports really come in because that's where they need to be able to connect into these vast... Uh, 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 data repositories. So there's kind of two models as to how that data is moved around. Some is kind of a simple peer-to-peer. -peer. Some of it requires uh, larger uh, teleport systems like Rory operates. Uh, secondly, set of observations. Uh, it may or may, you may not have seen, but yesterday Ireland announced its first space strategy for enterprise. Um, it's available on the, on the, 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 the Department of Business, Enterprise, and Innovation website. Um, I was on the steering group for that. And uh, the strategy itself is really important because for the first time, we don't have to uh, walk carefully around the idea that Ireland might see real opportunities in space. And that's curious because we have been in the European Space Agency for 30 years now. And if you're an ESA-funded company, or if you do a project with ESA, the general rule of thumb is your return on investment is seven to one. 
So we have about 70 companies, I think it's slightly less, I think it's 67, 70 companies in this country, some of which are small and do projects with ESA, some of which work almost exclusively with ESA. But space has a very good return on investment. There is also going to be a space technology fund as part of Ireland 2040. So now that starts to get interesting. Where do we spend our money on the space technology? Is it to help solve the rural broadband issue or broadband in general? That's not for me to decide, of course. Not for anybody individually. But there are particular other LEO opportunities. I mentioned a lot about broadband, but by the way, LEOs don't just do broadband. They can do earth observation. Uh, they can do geostationary. In fact, you're going to see that a lot of the geostationary stuff will transfer from geo, geostationary satellites, the, the global positioning for your autonomous vehicles, to low Earth orbit satellites. So that's going to allow you to know where you are in 10 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds, because uh, remember, you don't have to go all the way to the States to find that out. You've got LEOs close over to you, so actually potentially much much lower than 15 milliseconds, come to think of it, in, in under 10 milliseconds to find out where you are. So, um, but there's also the one, two things I want to point out. Cybersecurity. If we don't get into cybersecurity in space, we're fools. Okay, there you can take that home as a statement. The other thing is optical communications. That's where we're going to go. At the moment, we use radio frequency, but that's going to switch. And we have a number of companies already working in that domain. Here's the thing. Optical Optical communication doesn't work well through cloud. But if you've got a constellation, you find a link where there's a downlink, but there's no cloud. So that's the way that's going to work. But the bandwidth is so enormous that the European Space Agency makes the point that optical com is the future of this technology for, a, for, for, for high bandwidth applications. Um, so because of the time associated with this, I just want to show you one other, other thing. You might have seen this image. Uh, in social media. So SpaceX launched 60 satellites a few weeks ago. This is what they looked like as they were just launched over the Netherlands. A big furore amongst the astronomical community about this because it's, it's ruining the skies above us. Um, so here's the thing, you could, we can all sit back and say, sorry, uh, you, you saw what it looked like, and I know I'm out of time. Um, so, but suppose you can make, suppose you're a company that makes black stuff, that is RF transparent and you can start to hide these satellites. There's a big market for you. The only reason I mention that is uh, the enormity or the breadth of the issues that will start to come in as we put up LEO constellations will be an opportunity because the, 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 the negatives associated with them will come from different, many different places and negatives can be turned into a positive if you can solve that issue. I know that sounds so cliche, didn't it? I didn't mean to. So in summary, LEOs, are a disruptive technology, they're here to stay. They will provide low latency internet, they will outperform fiber. The bandwidth is the issue, it's technology dependent. So for the foreseeable future, we're talking about rural areas and that's perfect because that's where we have the problem. Um, the present estimates are around a terabit per second for Ireland, which is around 8% 8, 8 of the broadband area and the future, may be significantly higher if we go to optical comms. So it would seem to me that immediate conversations with LEO providers from a national broadband plan would be, let's just say, prudent. So let's not stick our heads in the sand. Let's see before it's too late if there's something we can do to help our rural community. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Niall, thank you very much. I think I've been elected as the runner with the, uh, with the mic. So if anybody has any questions, I'll run to you. I've just one comment. Um, re the thing about the broadband via satellite, um, when you're saying that it's coming of age, the one thing I wanted to point out is that we've had satellite broadband in Ireland since 99. Okay, so it has been effectively working we put in systems for the revenue commissioners for a lot of big ticket guys the problem it has always had has been latency now the reason i'm pointing out it's it's not that it's a new technology as a technology it's just the latency is now gone 
And that's a really, really big deal that it's, it's proven technology. It already has worked here for 20 years, but now the latency, which was the problem, is gone. Hi. Um, just a quick question about the latency across the water or across the pond. Uh, did you take account, or is that a theoretical best case, or have you taken account of, let's say, hop, hop by hop introduced latency in terms of processing electro-optical conversion and electro-RF conversion? Yeah, based upon, so I didn't do that simulation. So that's done by a guy in University College London. So he has a paper out about that. So he does take that into account based upon what, ev what information is made available at the moment from the satellite providers. Do you have any idea of the hop, per hop latency introduced just by the processing, let's say, on the satellite itself? I, I, I don't. I don't. Thank you. I, I would have an idea, but I, would, I, I, I don't. Thank you. I have two quick questions. The first was, uh, what your slide showing a, a potential one terabit capacity available for Ireland showed 4,500 LEOs in orbit to provide that. Um, how many are there, there now? And have you any projections about the time frame to get to 4,500? And the second question I have is, are there any projections around the cost per gigabit, for example, uh, that, that may apply or, or any projections showing that in the future? Uh, so, so the first thing is the, the Federal Communications Commission in the US have given, Star, uh, given SpaceX permission to operate the Starlink constellation on the basis that they will launch 4,000 satellites by the end of 2022. And if they don't, then, so they may not. But th that's what's basically put the squeeze on that number. Uh, Assuming they put them in the orbits, which they are suggesting that they're going to put them in, that they have permission to launch in, so you have to have quite a flight plan, then what that will mean is that we will likely see 60 above Ireland at any given time. If the uh, angles were optimized, let's say, you could see more. If they were de-optimized, you could see less. So, so it's a little bit of a, it, it, it's a, that's why it's a roughly one terabit per second thing. Uh, and your second question was, oh yeah, so what, again, so what SpaceX's comment is that it will be cheaper than any of the terrestrial broadband providers currently. And I think, so what they're, they're, they're talking about $50 a month is, is the number that they have, have suggested for uh, uh, rural broadband using their Starlink satellites in the US. One thing to be, to be uh, I should say, is we don't, the Federal Communication Commission can, can allow SpaceX to transpond over the US. They currently wouldn't be allowed to do that over Ireland to, un, until that gets sorted out. Um, so there's a, there's a regulatory issue there. I, I would hope that wouldn't be a big thing. It, it, will, still, it will still always bring in a conversation about people about interference, uh, uh, radio interference and so on. Of course, absolutely. Um, just on that, and, and absolutely not an, an apologist for, for SpaceX, um, they understand that their business model requires them to win regulatory permission in lots of uh, lots of domains. The U.S. market actually isn't big enough in rural terms. Uh, it's it's the likes of Africa and India. We just happen to be very well placed. We're a tiny market. We will make no difference to the to the SpaceX business model, but we might benefit from it. Yeah. Um, just in terms of implementation in the National Broadband Plan, what would need to change in the current plan and how do we go about utilizing low Earth orbit satellites for the rural homes, like we rent them or? So um, let, let's imagine a, 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 a scenario in which uh, low Earth orbit providers are allowed to uh, transmit and receive at, at uh, frequencies which they operate, so KU, KA band frequencies. Let's imagine that they're given permission to that. And um, then in a way, 
uh, the market takes over. I mean, there's nothing to stop somebody else completely unconnected to the National Broadband Plan uh, if, if they have permission to, to allow that, to install that technology. And, and a little bit, it's, it's, it's so similar to the way we do Sky to home at the moment. The difference with Sky is it's a ge they're geostationary satellites and it's a dish. This is a flat box that you just sit. But, and okay, there's a lot going on because the satellites are moving. So in principle, there's nothing to stop um, that happening whether you're the well, I, I shouldn't say I don't know if the I don't know if the contract precludes others providing broadband. I assume it doesn't. I'm guessing that would be a very bad contract. That we that, that there'll be no competition. I don't know. I, I I don't know that. So I just realised that as you asked that question. But it the, the for me one of the things I think that's interesting is in a few years' time we will have these satellites which will be connecting. They've already done some tests in the U.S. By the way, I mean I, I should point that out. Uh, all of these providers have done tests. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, there was a 5G test done using LEO satellites uh, through the UK. Uh, so people are looking at how we use 5G through satellites as well. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, to, to sort of go back to your question, the, the, there's nothing from a technology point of view to, to stop this. In, uh, it, it, what Starlink say is, or SpaceX say is, that the, by the end of this year, or early next year, they will start commercial operation. That's what they're saying. So they will be providing commercial broadband in the US using their Starlink system by the end of the year. Uh, uh, to me, the track record suggests that's possible, possible, incredible. So if, if we're asking what we need to do, we need government to go and look at this, understand the regulatory requirements of changing the way, that, the, 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 the way we communicate uh, and making sure that the, re the regulatory requirements are clear. That's what government can do. Then private sector can come in and do the technology piece. So we don't need government to do anything on the technology side. We just need government to allow for the new technology. Gary Duggan, Irish Academy of Engineering. Thanks very much for an excellent presentation. Two queries. One is the 1.2 terabits you pointed out there. You're saying 40,000 homes, megabytes. Would there not be a considerable amount of diversity between those, and that the number could be very substantially larger than the 40,000? And I'm drawing from just my electricity background, where they assume in urban areas two and a half kilowatts per house after diversity maximum demand. So I would say you could get something like five times yeah. what you're talking about. The second thing is, earlier this year, the FT published quite a long article saying that Leos were a marvelous way of losing money. And I'm just wondering what is changing that because the FT doesn't normally tend to be so negative about a technology in terms of its financial aspects. Yeah, so uh, for, first of all, the, 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 your first question. Uh, so I specifically didn't want to increase that number of 40,000 because it would then start to sound like um, too much of a PR exercise almost. So to me, that's a conservative. If everybody is using their 30 megabits per second all the time, we should be able to provide that for 40,000. But you're absolutely right. That is not going to be the case in reality. And I, I, I think your factor of five or more is probably absolutely the case. I think that would need a bit more careful analysis than, than I have done. Uh, so uh, so I, I think that, that, that's absolutely true. And again, here you made the comment about, you know, your 10 megabit per, sec megabit per second is often as much as you ever use sort of in your day-to-day in -day business. And most of us don't use the 30. I, I know there's gaming and streaming and so on, some of our kids and all of that, but absolutely. The, 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 the question on the, on the financial time. So I've, I've read a, a lot of different reports uh, and indeed, it's the common, the same about making, you know, to make, a large, to make a small fortune, you start with a large fortune and so on in, in this domain. What, what, what is, is changing the, the model if, if, you, if you read the business cases? Now, the Financial Times clearly have a different view on this. The ones that I've seen are that you, at the moment, you have uh, a move towards this uh, hyper-connectivity amongst uh, First world countries, I don't think we can use that phrase anymore. And then for the developing countries, there's 3.8 or thereabouts, billion of those who are effectively not connected at the moment. 
that's a huge new marketplace for gold. That seems to, and that marketplace cannot be activated uh, with fiber. It could be activated wireless. There's definitely opportunities there. What is happening here is the, um, uh, the companies, I guess, are taking a bet that if they can provide the, the data that they say they can, and they've demonstrated in smaller quantities and scaling up, as you well know, is, is not always, uh, you know, it's, not, it's non-linear, uh, uh, that they've demonstrated that the, the, that the technology works. They can see that the, the market requires this level of connectivity. And then the question is, is there's the technology that will do it. Uh, the Financial Times will have a view. Uh, SpaceX will have a view. Morgan Stanley, Bryce have a view. All the ones I've seen suggest that it's worth trying. Now, your point is well made. Suppose we say, let's not put the fiber in and all the rest, but rely on this. And this turns out to be a dose. Well, actually, if it's going to take us seven years to put it in, we know long before then whether this is going to work. These guys aren't waiting seven years to, to figure it out. So I, 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 that wasn't an answer. I know, Jerry, to your question about why the Financial Times think that. Lots of reports um, uh, consider with, with different outcomes, um, uh, and there's definitely risk, definitely risk associated. Uh, now I'll have a question for you. Michael Laughter, the Cork Institute of Technology. I suppose uh, if we set broadband to one side and look at new space more generally, um, in relation to IT companies, is there a business opportunity in new space now that didn't exist five or 10 years ago? And is that opportunity to preserve of space tech specialist companies or generic IT companies, software development companies, data analysis companies, and so on? Yeah, Michael, thanks very much for the question. So you're absolutely right. Um, so because broadband is only a small element of, uh, of the, the new space uh, marketplace. Um, so new space will be driven by companies who, for the most part, are not space-based companies. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of the technologies uh, are being built into these satellites called CubeSats. This isn't a CubeSat per se, but small satellites. It will cost you about 150, 200 grand, if you like, to, to launch a CubeSat and operate it. But you might be the piece, for example, that um, does the, the camera on board. Areas which I think, sorry, let me try to be more clear in my answer. The short answer is this. If I was an IT company, I would be looking at the opportunity in space now for whatever it is I'm doing right now. Because there's almost no domain that doesn't require technological developments. Whether it's on the ground segment, whether it's on the comm segment, think of new materials for launchers. Think of if you can make something lighter, if you can make something work at a higher temperature, if you can improve the... Uh, the, the, uh, the thermal properties, if you can secure the, uh, the connectivity, if you can do onboard. Uh, we talked a lot about data rates here. Uh, one of the big challenges going forward is some of the satellites are going to be taking images of the Earth. And at the moment, the model is they transmit that back down to Earth and then it gets stored and analyzed. But as we move into the artificial intelligence era, on the fly analysis, which provides the information that the customer needs and then transmits small amounts of data back to Earth, will become more and more commonplace. So, because it's the, it's the data stuff that at the moment remains uh, more complicated, more expensive. So, it, I would say for me, it would be really interesting to, uh, like, we, we have the cyber cluster in Cyber Ireland, uh, which is led out of CIT. And that came because business has said, we, we, we're, we're involved in, in cybersecurity in different ways. You know this better than me, Michael. You are a, a leader and a driver in that. In the same way, what we need to do, and this is from an Irish perspective and certainly from a regional perspective, is to have more of these conversations about what are the opportunities, not just with the European Space Agency, but with private companies. I think it's about awareness raising. One of the things in the National Space Strategy yesterday was aware, uh, um, raising the awareness uh, of what space offers. And interestingly, there were two entities charged with doing that. One 
was Blackrock Castle Observatory, and one was the Irish Space Industry Group. Uh, the reason why we're leading the awareness raising is because we've been trying to do it for a number of years, and we need now to try to up our game uh, on that. But I would say, absolutely, there is no company, you don't have to have any space pedigree whatsoever to start thinking about getting in, into the space domain. There will be, like in any business, there'll be challenges along the way. But it is a really exciting time if you're a tech company. Sorry, sorry, I'm actually going to have to terminate it there. I'm getting sorry. signals from the back of the room. We promise to get people out by nine in case they have meetings. We know there are people going across RebelCon. So I'm going to hand over to Jerry, no, or to Anthony. All right, so thank you very much. So look, th thanks very much to Niall. Um, R Rory and I from uh, National Space Centre and Cloudcakes are delighted to have had the opportunity to um, uh, to, to sponsor this event and we think the venue is fantastic and thanks to the organizing committee okay for for, for doing it Niall that was an amazing talk and I think if we can all just give him a final round of applause <laughs>